national development plan bi plan la bi nga xamne ni pour plan yi rewmi la naka la ñoy def develop rewmi plan bi ni domi rew bu neka yang si am wala ndp bi lo lo mu na gis moy ma commencé ci yoni bori passa mas fale ligui nañ fa ay yon modern route yon yi nga xamné ni yon yu bax nañ té légui ciono dem di taxa wala dem di am naka naka comme problème lo lepp légui mu na wax né passé na am school yi ñu le nay taba li ndp bi ku neka mo wara taxaw gis né li ñu ñok mom ku neka dafa wara jël ownership né li man mako mom access to water ndox tamé war nañ ko mëna am gis nañ mu ngi am ay bohul ñu ngi am ay ndox li yépp mu ngi ñew fi ni mu ngi mu ngi mu ngi am légui ni sax ñu ngi ñew start eh nak 86 li kilometer road moy wuñaadu kunté haklang bobu nonu is a very big project bo xamné ni mu ngay ñew start am ci fi ak ay li bu new gis na time bu new so fok na dal am lu bari mu ngay am tam ndp bi tamé try na expand am rural electrification li project bi ni moy gox yi té yépp mëna am eh li kurang kunté amna kurang ki nguur bi président moko jité dafa am ene ak ité develop rewmi luko doré ci yoon yi ndo eh ak kurang l'hôpital ni school yi lepp lo xamni dal social amenity la social needs la lolu dina try ñu am ko suñ ko muñta am tamé ci suñ bir nek yi waye duñu sori so jele li nga xamne ni nga tie ko ne yo yak mom in fok nga tie ko nga fonka ko be pare mu mun la tamé njeriñ li nekut am ci benna anam wala benna bor waye lu ma li dal moy euh plan la bi nga xamne ni plan yi rewmi la té pour naka lañoy def be muna develop gambia bi nga xamne ni ñu ñok mom ci lu bari comme no bi wa ci courant ci yoni ci ndo ci school yi l'hôpital yi ak yu bari 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 té gis nañ né stana mu ngi am nanga nanga kon lolu eh naka santé la mu na wané mu ngi dem nanga nanga waaw previously we did not have a ministry of climate change we only had a ministry of forestry years ago and then just before 2018 we had a ministry of environment climate change so the climate change insertion of climate change in the name was to show our international partners that we mean business when it comes to climate change because the gambia has been recognized as one of the most vulnerable countries in the world among the 100 most vulnerable and among the most vulnerable in mainland africa this vulnerability is due to um, us being dependent largely on our natural resource base especially the agriculture sector we also depend largely on tourism both of these sectors are highly being affected negatively by climate change to give an example um, the natural resource sector agriculture 70% of gambians depend on agriculture whereas um, and almost 98% depend on rainfed agriculture so if climate change is going to change our rainfall patterns to make it shorter then it means that this is going to affect the majority of gambians and that's a problem Um, on the other side, with regards to tourism, we used to have 150 meters of, of sand in front of the Kololi Beach Hotel, Senegambia area. And as we know, tourism, the key, some of the key principles or tenets of tourism required is sea, sand and sun. So we've lost almost 135 meters of that 150, meaning that in some areas there are less than 15 meters of beach left. So this obviously reduces the value of um, the value of our tourism area uh, over tourism and might not be so attractive to people who are coming from international from other countries um climate change is um is is all encompassing because it does not leave any sector out it affects livestock as i mentioned earlier it affects women and children it affects the health sector because it makes more some other diseases more prevalent and in the gambia it's a big problem because as since we depend so much on agriculture when the agriculture system is not successful I remember in 2011 it was declared uh, we had 70% 71% crop failure which I believe in any country would be a very serious issue 
and this leads farmers who have now invested all their inputs into the ground and do not have timely information on the, at the, whether the rains will be good or bad. Um, this takes them into poverty and this forces them to now go into the forests and the natural resource base to extract uh, resources so that they can survive. That's why, I mean, charcoal proliferation, as we've seen, is, is increasing around the, around the country. Previously, it was only found in certain regions, but now in almost all the regions, there are uh, people involved in the uh, production and sale of charcoal. Charcoal production has been banned since 1981, but unfortunately, the use of charcoal is not banned. So it means you, you cannot make it, but you can use it. That creates demand for charcoal. And the biggest demand for charcoal is in this region, the western region. Myself, you, you listening or watching me, I do, uh, we are the ones who are guilty because we all cook using charcoal. In Senegal, what they managed to do was to, to subsidize the use of LPG gas for a few years to bring it down to a level where people could afford it. Then once people got used to this and then they managed to slowly reduce the production of charcoal, they now brought the prices back up and then everybody has, is now used to it so they cannot find a change their mode of cooking. So I think we also need some innovative practices such as that to try and change the way people live. In fact, here we also have um, a lot of improved cook stoves. We have the, the, the Kumbagei, I think called, the other one is called Pendambai or something like that. These are cook stoves that have been developed in the Gambia by various um, NGOs, etc. But because of the prices, um, people find it difficult to buy it. But these cook stoves don't use charcoal. If they do use charcoal, they use a minimal amount of charcoal because they are more efficient. So I think this is also another area where um, government can support to either subsidize or at least promote the use of some of these products which are already available. importance of water when it comes to the agricultural systems and I'm sure many people skeptics would wonder but what about the river we have an entire river it's all full of water fresh water why can't we use it to irrigate the entire country because on the ground that's not the situation part of the river Gambia is, is now saline previously it, it came all the way to Kaur but because we are having less um, every year this saline front is pushed backwards by surface runoff that comes all the way from Guinea Conakry, from the Futa Jalan Highlands, if you remember your uh, high school geography. Um, but with less rainfall, we are having less of a push. So the, now in areas such as Kuntawur, which is a major rice growing area, you might find mangroves. There might not be many. And anywhere you find mangroves is an indication that there is saline intrusion. In North Bank also, it's a problem. Villages like Ilyasa Badibu have had some in the past have had their rice fields inundated by salt making it uh, useless. So this is something that unless um, some innovative measures are taken, it, it's going to be a problem. Even the hippo population, to talk about human wildlife conflict, which is also another challenge we face, um, most of the hippo population is found in the Central River region. And the saline front is moving in from the left, whereas human development is limiting the expansion of, this, of the areas that uh, the hippos have. So with time, they are being forced into smaller and smaller areas, which one causes conflict between the hippos and two causes conflict between the hippos and the farmers because now they, not, they, they will be forced to invade people's farms as they have been doing, but now it will be at a at more frequent uh, rate. And this is going to lead to a loss of, of revenue from farmers and can also lead to conflict because there have been cases where either hippos attack people or people um, attack the hippos as well. So I think people need to understand the situation on the ground first um, before making uh, certain suggestions which are not practical. With regards to the problems, the problems in the Gambia are numerous. Um, we've seen flooding episodes in the last 10 years. We've had a lot of flooding in Ibo town, in Base. Um, you can determine whether it's due to poor land use planning or whether it's due to intensive rainfall. That's up to you. 
but I mean, obviously, the rainfall plays a, it plays a very big part, as well as um, land use planning. We have agricultural crop failures, I would like to call it that. For example, I've cited 2011 and some other years where we had very low um, output from the agriculture sector because the rainfall was not good enough. Even last year, we, we had, I let believe, less than almost two full months of rainfall, if not. And because we experienced a lot of dry spells in between. This has a feedback because when people invest all their money into the agriculture sector and it fails, they are forced to enter the natural resource base, such as forest, etc., and prepare charcoal or cut trees for timber, etc., which also make the problem even worse because part of the problem of climate change is that we don't have, where you have a lot of trees, you normally have a lot of exchange of water between the ground and the atmosphere. Most people don't know this. But when you have less trees, and I mean like ancient trees, if you go to Casamas, you check countries like Sierra Leone, countries like Ivory Coast, they have a lot of rainfall compared to us because they have more forest cover. So I think that's something that the government needs to look at again. And one of the major challenges we have is timber. Um, timber benefits few people, but then many people suffer. And I think if you go across the country, most communities are finding this as an issue because they've all realized that the benefits are not for everyone, but the problems are, the brunt of the problem is carried by everyone. So I think this is something that we can try to improve, to regulate, if not stop completely. Because on one hand, we have international taxpayer money, over $25 million given to us to reforest our country. And on the other hand, we are cutting down trees, whether here or in another country, and re-exporting them. So it, it doesn't send out a very good picture of what we are trying to do. So I think we need to, to, to decide on what is our priority. Climate change affects those who depend on natural resources the most. And that would have to be people in the rural setting. Um, these are people who have to get water from a well or from the village. If there's not enough rain, th that resource is, is limited. Um, we've seen cases when we're developing a UGBA project, communities where they told us that sometimes it would get so dry that they would have to decide whether they drink or their animals drink. And I don't think that's a decision that any farmer needs to make, to be honest. Um, so, I mean, these are some of the, these are some of the, some of the problems that that we see, we see all the time. And rural communities have less financial, technical, or in, in overall adaptive capacity to move out of the shocks that they experience. We, we had an incident a few years ago in uh, Kuntawur where there was a flooding. Flooding because of surface runoff from Senegal, because it's a low-lying area, and also a lot of rain fell in that area over a short period of time. This also takes me back to the National Climate Change Fund because I remember that response of government at the time was perceived as a bit slow, but um, had it been that the, this national fund was created, then the local government actors in that area could have done something before government's actual national intervention got there. And this would have helped. And again, most of the people who suffered there are rural farmers. A lot of farms were inundated and other people's houses and material were, were washed away. So I think really it's, it's very clear. And among the rural people as well, women and children are the most vulnerable. Because we know uh, in our country, gender is still an issue that people are getting to grips with. Um, and studies have shown over and over that um, women, for example, in the rural areas, women would have to walk kilometers to get water. They'd have to walk a long distance to get firewood. So if there's a degradation of this environment, they would be the ones to suffer because they would have to go longer distances or put in more efforts to get simple resources that we take for granted here in, in the capitals. So the role of the ministry is key with managing climate change. The ministry is the policy institution given the overall mandate to deal with all policy related issues with regard to climate change. Strategic oversight, strategic um, guidance for sectors, um, coordination, the ministry is, is, is in charge of that. The ministry also heads the negotiations of the Gambia for the UNFCCC, which is the Climate Change Convention based in uh, Germany, Bonn. Um, also, the ministry is responsible for developing uh, project proposals in collaboration with other sectors to enable um, the Gambia to move because we cannot have a business as usual approach because climate change is not business as usual. As I mentioned, we're having changes in our rainfall, temperature changes. I mean, disasters are becoming more and more frequent. So it's important that uh, 
the government or the ministry have responses to all those uh, preventive measures rather than just uh, reactive measures. So this is a part of what the ministry does. And it works in close collaboration with um, all the natural resource sectors because climate change affects everybody, um, be it infrastructure, be it women. As we know, women and children are the most vulnerable to climate change. So it's very important to make sure that they are on board and they have a voice with regards to what happens with regards to climate change in the Gambia. Um, the ministry also um, has been working through the policy. It has technical uh, oversight committees at various levels, even up to the regional levels, and it's working to empower local governments to be able to have access to funding through the National Climate Change Fund, which we are currently uh, working to develop, that will uh, support, this, this support the decentralization policy and allow stakeholders at the regional level to be able to make decisions um, on their own, of course, in collaboration with us, but at least gives them some flexibility with regards to taking care of some of their own issues. Kumase, bula ne henga jen water in kan, nga jen di water nak nga water danka nga hamne dun dano dun deftera wa di na jen diri nyati fan be juro mi fan balanyu sa sun sa hebe pare bente nga meko kontine mu 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 sa then. Um, so I'm a where a fuki fan or where a juro mi fan. I am ne film ne kani. I am ne jole. Pot ye len je jel. Pot ye ham na nyu ham ne ko pas ke sun hevi yep den ko je use. Mo ham bu nyu si hevi la be pare. Mo ham binga je dala. Sa dole fum to lo rek. Wa ham na ne pur am ko du jafe. Legi so nyu we nga jel ko pot bi danga har si diga. Lo 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 ta nga ko ide mo ne. Ndo bi pas ke dinga continue de ko wata. Ten ndo bi si def dinga bany muta house si bir because do amal dara binjeri so ndox bi da fay bug di wacce ci souf di dem so legi pot bi ni nga koy xare sidiga so lañ mune gis gis nga sidiga fi nga koy xare soko xare ba pare nga jël ko nga nga tek feka sa garab bi amna wera juroomi fan nga jël ko sampat ko fi am li tax nga koy sampa fi rek moy pour mu gëna am doole parce que xam nañ ne soko yobé ci garden bi ak ci ki beye xare ngelewli dañ am doole ba paré wonté su dégéré rek di moment nga sampa ko rek da fay taxaw légui so paré ci lolu nonu am lima bëggona wax moy né bala nga koy sampa fofu tam da ngay dem ci garden bi nga défar ay pax diganté pax ak pax am juroomi métar da wara tollu diganté bi den nga gas pax bi bem xawa hot rek nga def soufi daral bi nga jël sa lañ tuti jaxasé ko ak mom soko jaxasé ba paré bi nga xamné wata nga ko 2 1 2 1 or 1 to 3 days den nga ñew jël sa garab bi nekk fi nga soko li da ngay xar fi ni rek dina bayyi suuf den nga sampa ko soko sampé nga xamné comme ni mako waxé rek juroomi métar mo nekk wara nekk sen distance bi waye su féké né am nga hectare juroom ñett fukki garab nga soxla pour mu mëna def lepp li nga soxla mom li moy def moy su fruit fly ci ñëwé euh bala ñuy dem ci mango yi ñom dañ xer ci mom di nga gis ñom dinañ baña dem ci mango bi ñu ñëw lekk fi meanwhile bala bobu rek di nga gis né féka ya ngi amé sa trap bi buñ paré fi bala ñoo délu rek nga xamné trap ci dinañ lañ attract ba paré ray lañ ko di nga gis né fépp fuñ ko def def nañ ko bonto liggéey né ñoo raat ville def ko bonto def nañ ko tumani tenda def nañ ko ba sori ak jamban jele ci west coast region bi fini te liggey nañ ci ñetti at ñi limay wax ni ñi liggey lepp xam nañ dañ ñom soxla nañ ko ñu ñuy call every day ñu ñuy call li ñu wonne soxla nañ ko waye nak liggey bo gis so ci paré dafa am app ñu dañuy gestu waye buñ gestu ba paré amna ñi ñuy jox ñi nga xamne ñoo wara delu ci ci pharmacie pour jox leen baykat yi legui fofu leen tollu waye buñu yalla baye bala nawet bi di ñew yaakar neen ne ñu bari yeen ñu bari di ngeen ko am legui suñu ko amé na seigne xel delu ci liñ leen won ni nga xamne du ngeen ci am ben jafeñ jafeñ pour continuer seigne liggéey legui ma baye leen merci ta the ecosystem based adaptation project is is a very important project because it's the first project that has been approved by the current funding mechanism under the climate change framework known as the Green Climate Fund. I was lucky to have worked heavily on its development and it's, not, it's probably, you can say, it's the flagship project for the ministry at the moment.
because we are trying to, as I mentioned, deforest almost 10,000 hectares around the country, as well as also providing entrepreneurship training and equipment for 125 communities around the country. And it's also looking to build on the, the capacity of institutions because that is something that is always, there's always space to improve that. The, especially the Department of Forest and Department of Parks and Wildlife and the Department of Community Development. They are the three institutions that are implementing this under the ministry in collaboration with the ministry. The project is, is extremely important and um, is looking to have a lot of impact because it's, it's supporting the Department of Forestry, for example, to revamp some, most of its forestry stations around the country, also to create nurseries around the country so that communities in anywhere in the country, wherever you are, you can have access to seedlings so that you, you can be involved in the fight to, to reforest the Gambia. Because I remember in the, when I first started working, the Gambia was a net sink with regards to emissions. Our forest cover was enough and what we are emitting was very low, so it was almost considered zero. It was a balance between what we are emitting and what we are conserving. But now that our forest cover is dwindling, uh, we are now emitting, although it's still a negligible amount of almost 0.001%. But nonetheless, we still have to be part of the movement to reduce the greenhouse gases in the atmosphere. To be honest, there's been a lot of sensitization, but as the adage says, sensitization is a continuous process. You cannot just sensitize people once and stop there because it takes a long time to change the mindset of a person. And we have, in collaboration with the Department of Water Resources, have done many sensitizations with regards to the climate change on itself. We've also done many sensitizations with regards to the policy and roles of, of local communities, uh, regional governments, the media, etc., within that policy. And we've had workshops which are more interactive, where we've invited the media, um, trained them on climate change reporting and then have uh, group breakout sessions where people interact with each other to give them more of a practical feel of, of what they're doing. Um, with the Ministry of Finance, we, under the Green Climate Fund Readiness, we also had a monthly radio session at the uh, Gambia Radio and Television Services and West Coast Radio, where each Friday, first Friday of each month, we would meet and talk about climate change, about projects that could come from climate, the climate change area. And we would have a phone in, people would phone in and express their interest and their comments and concerns. And it was very interactive because we could see that people knew about climate change, but they did not know about the technicalities. So it was an opportunity for us to share this with people and get a common understanding. Um, with regards to impact, I think our achievements, we've, we've done quite a lot. I think one of our biggest achievements is having the National Climate Change Policy because this signals to everybody out there that the Gambia is taking climate change seriously and have not just taken it seriously but have developed a very organized and concerted framework that is robust and looks holistically at all sectors and their vulnerabilities and also the potential for them to um, adapt to the issue of climate change. Um, also, I mean, with regards to to projects, we've, we've developed quite a few projects. The EBA project is one of the success stories, although it's currently under implementation. The PPCR project um, gave us our, SPC, our strategic program, which is now the flagship program under the National Development Plan. Um, we have a long-term strategy. Also, our global contribution to minimizing the impact of climate change is called the National Determined Contribution, or NDC. Every country has one. And According to the UNFCCC, Gambia and Morocco have the most ambitious NDCs that if we implement it would lead us to, we would achieve the targets of the Paris Agreement, which is a temperature increase of not more than 1.5 degrees centigrade. So I think definitely the Gambia is making a lot of progress. There is a lot of impact with regards to what we are doing, the projects on the ground, but I think we can always improve. We can always improve by prioritizing the environment sector. Under the National Development Plan, climate change has been clearly identified as a critical enabler, which is, makes us technicians very happy. And also, under the flagship program for environment, um, one of the projects that we, have, we are prepared, developing under our strategic program for climate resilience, also known as the SPCR, is a flagship project um, called Creating an Enabling Environment for Building Climate Resilience. This is seen as very important because to think about it, we've had a lot of money come in through agriculture, through many sectors with regards to projects. But a lot of times they fail. 
which is some people see it as that, some people. But we might not get what we expect. So I think what we re we've realized we need to do is to get our house in order by making sure that the institutions are, are well formed, making sure that the linkages between the institutions are very strong, coordination is very um, on point. That way, whatever international funding comes here will be utilized effectively. But otherwise, it always creates uh, gaps and, and implementation uh, bottlenecks. Um, also, with regard to natural resource management, we've seen some improvements with regards to um, currently, at least as far as I know, there is not much or no interference by government in terms of community for our forests, how they are managed, um, etc. I remember previous in the previous regime, we had two of our forests: the Kiang West National Forest Park and also the Tanje Bird Reserve, which were almost degazetted and handed over to a private company. But thank God, uh, that is not the case. Although we still have some ch some challenges with regards to natural resource management, such as um, charcoal production and also the issue of timber, which I think can be improved on because um, the Ministry of Environment has a lot of projects. One of our major projects is um, called the Ecosystem-Based Adaptation Project. This is a $25 million grant from the Green Climate Fund and it's looking to help the Gambia deforest 10,000 hectares, which is not small. Of these 10,000 hectares, 7,000 would be degraded forest and 3,000 would be degraded agricultural land. So obviously it's going to benefit people. They are also targeting 125 communities around the country and will be training two people in each of these communities on entrepreneurship management and how to have an alternative livelihood. Because in the end, climate change adaptation is all about having alternative livelihoods. People depend on agriculture. If it fails, what do they turn to? If there is no option, they normally go into the forest and extract either timber or other, other products. So having alternative livelihoods such as um, bee, beekeeping, uh, salt mining, even some small community forests where you can use woodlots and prepare you know, uh, beds, furniture, etc. But in a sustainable manner, these are all alternative sources of income. Because if people don't have income, that's when they will be forced to erode uh, our natural resource base. And the, the NDP has identified this as a priority because the development is no longer just development. The now concept of sustainable development is what is being practiced and also trying to achieve our sustainable development goals, one of which is climate change, um, um, etc. So I think the NDP is going towards, uh, sorry, the ministry has been working towards helping achieve the NDP through the EBA project, um, our SPCR project, and our other activities that, that we are currently carrying out. We've also done uh, four technical studies one of them a vulnerability assessment, which is, uh, was done the last, at the tail end of last year. Because it's like going to the hospital, you need to have a diagnosis first of what is the problem of the Gambia with regards to each region, because we are all different. And then we then had another technical study on what are the most appropriate or what are proposed livelihoods that could be introduced to some of these areas and even to look at what is working. Because one thing we always forget to do is to look at what is working and then trying to expand that or scale it up. So that has already been done. And very importantly, considering a lot of what I've said has revolved around rainfall, uh, crop production, uh, losses, etc. We're also looking at trying to implement having a crop-based insurance in the Gambia. This crop-based insurance, I'm sure you uh, would, would be based on, on climatic parameters. If there's rainfall below a certain amount, then farmers within a certain region would be paid out, would be, would be given a payout. So, and I think this is, is, is something that is highly um, important. Currently, the Gambia is part of the Africa Risk Capacity, which is a regional um, crop-based crop insurance scheme being organized at the African Union level. And the Gambia is a, is a party to that, but has yet to receive a payout because we have not had uh, years where um, the rainfall went below the threshold. But countries like Mauritania and Senegal have benefited from this, this um, scheme. So we're trying to see now how can we nationalize this. And with this we have been discussing with the Central Bank, um, the Insurance Association, etc. to try and see how in the next three to four years we can have something like this um, in the Gambia. So these are just some of the uh, interventions that we're doing. They are multifaceted. It's not just sensitization or just training, but looking at the whole picture because climate change, as, as I keep repeating, it affects every sector. So the response to that needs to be holistic and robust, cannot just be uh, piecemeal.
the Gambia is a small country, our natural resource base is not very wide. So we need to protect it, not just for ourselves, but for our children and our grandchildren. Because if we found forest here, it's because our grandparents took care of it. It's not because of us. So with regards to our, our coastal zone, um, this uh, fish processing, fish, uh, fish meal processing, we need to make sure that they're all done in an environmental sound way. And especially the timber trade, we need to look at it very well and determine whether it's a priority for us. Because we cannot be on one hand collecting international taxpayer money to reforest our country and on the other hand selling timber, whether legally or illegally. We just need to try and understand each other, what are we trying to do, and we support each other in achieving our targets and objectives. Because in the end, if it succeeds, it's for all of us. If it fails, it's for all of us. Luckily, I've been a civil servant for, I think, almost 10, 10 odd years, 10 to 11 years, um, starting off at the National Environment Agency. And one thing is we've, I've noticed is there's been a change in the previous administration and the current one compared to the current one with regards to how much flexibility we have and freedom to carry out our tasks. We don't have, so far I've not experienced any interference in any of our projects with regards to where our resources go. Although, and there's a certain issue that does confuse me, in that even though people are given more freedom now and take potentially more resources to do work, there seems to be less vigor in terms of carrying out their roles and responsibilities, which I think needs to improve because this is our country. Nobody is going to develop it for us if we don't develop it for ourselves. So like for example, someone like me, having completed my studies abroad, I came back within a week because everything I'd studied was to come and help my country. I mean, rather than saving somebody else's environment, the first thing I should do is to come and try and do what I can here first before going out to help others. So I think we all as Gambians need to, to have all hands on deck. Um, Gambia is a signatory to many multilateral environment. Let me speak on my area, just multilateral environment agreements. We have the Rio Declaration, the Rio Convention, which looks at three different areas, climate change, biodiversity, deforestation. The Gambia is a signatory to all of these, the Mita, Minamut, Minamut, Mata Convention on Mercury, etc. But one thing that has been a problem over time is all of these institutions require members, even LDC countries, which is Gambia's classified as, to, to give a, a membership fee, which is minimal. But sometimes paying this has been a problem. And if you look at what we tend to get from this, these organizations, is a thousand times more than what they ask from us. This has improved now. I think with regards to climate change, we've paid all our areas. And as I mentioned, we've received more than $52 million from climate change funds since 94 to now. So I think paying $1,000 or $100 or $500 should not be something that should be too difficult. But we are glad that this, uh, these commitments are now being, being fully met. This is one of the projects of its kind, like I've said, for the first time that UNCDF is intervening in the Gambia. And like their slogan goes, is unlocking both public and private finances for the poor. So obviously that will bring about that joy on the face of the local people. Because the program or the project is designed in such a way that um, whatever allocation is being transferred to the world accounts, 35% of that one is cast for money, cast for work, sorry. And then the 65% of it will be spent on physical project implementation. So obviously, um, the local people will identify their own workers on the project, and those workers are going to be paid out of that 35%. So with that money, they are going to be listed or first recruited, workers will be recruited, and then that list will be submitted to those of our um, has microfinance institutions that the project is also partnering with, be it Reliance and uh, Q Money. So Reliance is able to at least avail them that opportunity to have access to finance at their own level. And Q Money is also able to uh, provide or avail them the opportunity to have access to their uh, money in their mobiles. So meaning they have that mobile account and as well as account with the Reliance. So this avails them the opportunity to have access to finance very closely to them. 
and they can do they are free to do whatever they want to do with this money like in one of our um, trackings this particular boy came from Jara East where one of the project was um, located he said there was this day he wants to go to Banjul and uh, you he has very little money in his pocket. So when he reaches Soma, from Buren to Soma, at Soma, he just went to Reliance and uh, slot his card and be able to get some money to continue to buy you. So he said he was so happy. And if you see him, he definitely shows happiness on his face. Some said they have used the money to buy um, the small ruminants, which they want to use as social protection. And then uh, this and many more examples did come from the, um, those on cast for work. But for the communities, you have communities in the North Bank that are very somehow close to the border with Senegal. They don't have clean or safe water source in their community. They have to go to Senegal to get more, to get uh, um, safe water for their daily chores. So this project has given them a borehole with a reticulation system and some tap heads with, uh, distributed. On behalf of the government of the Gambia and the people of the Gambia, I express personal appreciation of their laudable contribution to the achievement of this component of the National Development Plan. Prior to the project, the Lamin Koto Pasamas Road had deteriorated badly due to a number of factors. A major factor was the uneven train, terrain through which the gravel road was built. An other factor was the absence of a proper inbuilt drainage system. Thus, the issue of drainage was one of the key factors considered during the project design process. As such, 120 culverts and drains have been constructed to ensure adequate drainage of both the main and access roads. These are meant to ease the proper movement of water from the road structure to outfalls. this afternoon to deliver a welcome statement on the opening and inauguration of the Lamen Koto Pasamas Road in Upper River Region. The reason for this gathering today is to officially witness the opening of the 121 kilometer long road to be presided over by His Excellency, the President of the Republic of the Gambia. The Saudi Fund for Development has previously provided loans totaling about 169 million US dollars for 12 projects, including transport, education, water, and economic development. In addition to five grants worth 43.5 million US dollars toward projects in the water and energy sector. Ladies and gentlemen, it goes without saying that the roads come with much other advantages, as improving access to the great agricultural potential of the northern northeast region, facilitating effective implementation of the government's rural development programs. In this respect, I acknowledge the significant funding provided by the Saudi Fund. The Kuwaiti Fund for Arab Economic Development, OPEC Fund for International Development, Arab Bank for Economic Development in Africa, Badia, and the African Development Bank, ADFD. I would like to thank the government of Republic of the Gambia for the kind reception and the warm welcome for the excellent arrangement made for this important ceremony. The ceremony of today is an important milestone in the development of mutual cooperation between the fund and your friendly country. 
Kuwait Fund attaches exclusively importance of this project as it aims to support the economic and social development in the northern eastern region of the Gambia by improving its link with the capital Banjul and its main seaport and further improve connection with the remaining regions of the country in all weather conditions to improve the exploration of the agriculture product and reduce the trans its transport cost and time and to facilitate people's access to market and social service. The road is widened to 10 meters carriageway in asphalt concrete in the major villages like Karantaba, Sami, Dembawandu, Kurao, Chamoy, Bajakunda and Sutukuba with safety measures like guardrails, road marking and speed bumps. The road has been designed to high standard with high quality signboards, curb, markers, posts and cat eyes. As we say, there is no success without challenges. So it went through many challenges, like the water crossing, hydraulic problems, some uh, material procurement. But uh, with the cooperation, uh, alhamdulillah, with all the parties, the uh, government, the NRA, NRA, the governors, the ministry, and all the local people, all of you had cooperated to resolve all these uh, uh, challenges which faced the project. All of us had achieved uh, this project uh, in uh, meeting the time as planned, the, techni the technical uh, requirements, and the budget. So, alhamdulillah, we had met the three main uh, challenges in it. Ladies and gentlemen, I, as the governor of Sierra, standing here to thank you, we owe it to the government of today. Starting from Lower Salum, Upper Salum, Nyani, Sami are all beneficiaries to this Laman Koto Pasamas Road. The honorable members here can attest to that. For several decades today, Laman Koto Pasamas is being the talk of the the government of the Gambia, starting from the executives, coming to the parliament, coming to departments, coming to the local people, throughout this country, the top of the Gambia, everywhere, everybody knows Pasamas Lamen Koto by name, but have never seen the road. And it's one of the best roads so far in this country. Thank you very much, Your Excellency. And the Ministry of um, Local Government, or Ministry of Works and the Contract. <laughs> Lamen koto pasamas silo lon mea lon ko gambia bele silo ni lon silo lon mea lon ko atinya da fafra da tembe da mea lon ko ni ko lamen koto pasamas ni ko pasamas droi ka fala jam fara gambia ko bari bi kabir nyanta ni silo kulila ye nyini ka silo nyanta kulila min tole ngoy silo ni mbita kulila pasamas le but the Passamas don't do that. Molbe can't afford a jam for that. But the left of Molbe alone can't afford to be Passamas man jam for banyuna. Passamas can't afford Mol Korolebi. Ola kenyingo bi barunga na Passamas. But the Passamas sadio kono jang. Ndemu mola di me alone konga tari kosoro le njisa sadio kono. 1997. Na muso be karandi rola nu. Andu ya post nu Passamas. Abe Karandiro la Nisade Okono Jang, Nata Jubia Pasamas in 1997. Mina Wato Mia Katasamalekono, Kabirim Bota Banjun, Manfuda no Pasamas, Fua Samuel and Fuda Pasamas Jang, Prokananda Muso Jubi. Hake Silo la Colea, Nan Lajan Suta Killing, Suta Fula, Nsarata Mbesaila, Nina Muso and Mulo di Nyola. Kabir Nasar Tangkaya ko saing ngalo itebe wulla pasamas kanak detran di banyun, but dene nete wulla banyun kanak itra kasama pasamas hakia silo la kole akam. Wolun namuso anio tora tabak anyaji obora kumboda aku kira ni tora bat because of pasamas la jam fokam. Bari wolun ba fokal lumbe nene ma mira nungkafu 
Laminko do pas ma silo. Nde fon de lamina ke la president wodi. Kanaka o silo donc ko pas ma bonne din gogon. For those of you who are old enough to remember the story of this road and if my memory serves me right you will agree that it has taken too long for this vital road to be constructed. It has been close to over 40 years of planning by past governments year in year out without any ground breaking. However, today we mark the final completion of the works. After three years, we commence on 2nd February 2017, coinciding with the start of this government under the leadership of His Excellency, the President Adam Abaro. It provides greater access to vast tracts of agricultural lands. It provides access to social facilities such as schools and health centers. It facilitates greater movement of people and goods, and it enhances the market potential of Sami, Sandu, Wuli districts, and beyond. I am proud to state that the development of these roads mirrors our mission as commitment to raising living standards by creating platforms for economic growth and job creation. The successful completion of this project is a clear signpost of the implementation of the National Development Plan. We will continue to maintain and expand the urban, secondary and feeder road networks in order to improve accessibility and induce acceptable travel times between destinations for all travelers. Ladies and gentlemen, I now declare the Lamin Koto Pasamas Road open and I thank you for your attention. project is helping to at least uh, bring that security at family level, particularly for those on cars for work, whereby they will be having access to finance and be able to at least um, go ahead with their daily livelihoods. So that alone is good for those families. But also it goes along with 
certain supports, technical supports, and capacity buildings that the department is rendering to the people. Um, that is encouraging the democratization process, thereby uh, bringing about that security and stabilizes the minds of the people because they now are able to know their roles in the development of their own communities and their own wards. So that is a security um, improvement uh, that this project is bringing about. And uh, I think knowing about the financial management aspect of it, you will be able to know how much you are entitled to as a ward committee and how should you be spending that money. That also is going to help in uh, improving people's spendings on program or project implementation. And it stabilizes the local communities because if you know these local communities, once funds has reached them, everybody will be ready to have at least or to know something about that phone. But we are so much transparent. We make sure people have, there are three standard indicators that are always met. People should have knowledge to the amount that has been transferred and they should also be able to uh, have that result within the time that has been set and as well as the service providers, the process in which the program implementation is taking, including the role of the service providers. So this is all bringing about security and economic transformation in those wards that the program is intervening in. Well, there is one strategic priority of the project, that is uh, building people's resilience against climate change. And that is why when we are assessing their needs, we use an instrument called CRVA, that is Climate Risk Vulnerability Assessment Tool. This is what we use together with the local people to assess their own vulnerability to climate change. And with these results, they, have, they, they normally come up with uh, programs or sorry projects or community projects that would be contributing to reducing the effect of climate change on their communities and uh, this is one aspect that is also linked to the uh, uh, NDP's climate change uh, and whatever issues in the Gambia and then two it is also addressing or contributing poverty to an extent that is also meeting or trying to meet uh, another MD, uh, SD, uh, NDP goals. And then the, the last one is the local governance, that it is trying to promote democracy and increase people's participation in their own development process to bring about that sustainable human development uh, to their communities or be inculcated in themselves so that they will be able to take charge of their own destiny.